Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this week's CPC seminar. My name is Jeff Hancock. I'm the co-director of the Cyber Policy Centre along with Nate uh, Persily. I'm really excited today to introduce uh, Carly Miller, who will be joining us from uh, the uh, Oversight Board with Meta. And uh, not only is she coming here from that really incredible perspective that I know we'll learn a lot from and hopefully have lots of questions about, she's also one of our very own. She worked with the Stanford Internet Observatory, so it's really nice to see someone from our own space all grown up. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Carly. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you to the Cyber Policy Center for having me. Um, like Jeff said, my name is Carly Miller, and I'm on the data and implementation team at the Oversight Board. Um, and prior to joining the board, I was with the Stanford Internet Observatory, um, so it's great to see some familiar, familiar faces here today. Um, I also had four shots of espresso, so I'm <laughs> wired and excited to present um, key findings from our paper, Burden of Proof, Lessons Learned for Regulators from the Oversight Board's Implementation Work, uh, which was published in the Journal of Online Trust and Safety here uh, in February. So the presentation is going to be split up into two parts. Um, in the first part of the presentation, we'll be doing some scene setting, including diving into the background of the board, our team's work within the organization, the regulatory environment, which makes, I think, our work relevant beyond our team, and our best practices for tracking recommendation implementation. In the second half, we're going to be stress testing these best practices in a series of case studies um, that I think shows the challenges with implementing our recommendations and also understanding their impact. I'm sorry. So in 2020, Meta set up the Oversight Board to deal with the ch difficult uh, content moderation problems on its platforms. So the board consists of 22 members from all over the world who are experts in international human rights law, freedom of expression, and digital rights. When the board was first designed, the main focus was on the legal framework that went into the case decisions. So a case includes binding decisions on individual pieces of content and also non-binding recommendations. However, as the board began to operate, two things occurred. Um, the board realized that the main vehicle for making systemic change within Meta was actually through the recommendations. And also, while the board began um, issuing recommendations to Meta, we didn't have an independent mechanism for evaluating whether Meta had implemented the recommendation or not. So if Meta had missed the mark on the recommendation, which has happened before, um, meaning they misinterpreted it or um, didn't address it at all, the board didn't have a way of recording this, our assessment, beyond the score that Meta gave itself on the recommendations. So because of this, um, the board created the implementation committee and hired our team, so along with my boss data <laughs> implementation officer, Naomi Schiffman, um, in uh, July of 2021 um, to help with this tracking process. So, ooh, okay. um, on the screen here, you'll see a life cycle of a recommendation. Um, before we get to the board, how this all works is, um, let's say a user posts a picture on Instagram and it gets taken down. That user has the ability to appeal the decision to Meta, um, and if Meta rejects the appeal, then that user can then make their appeal to the oversight board. So from this pool of appeals, the board then selects a set number of them to take on as cases that they believe address systemic issues within Meta and also align with board priorities. So the board then hears the facts of the case and makes a binding decision on that individual piece of content and also issues a non-binding recommendation or can uh, issue multiple recommendations. So Meta must uh, publicly respond to the recommendations. They don't need to implement them, but they do need to respond. And to date, the board has issued over 260 recommendations to Meta. Um, and our team's role is to independently verify if Meta has implemented the recommendation or not. We then apply 
the reasons why Meta chose to implement or chose not to implement the recommendation to the future crafting of recommendations to make sure those lessons are learned. So why are we talking about this today and how does it relate to regulation? I'm very aware that non-binding recommendations are not the same as regulation. Uh, they don't have the same teeth, et cetera, et cetera. But if you hear me out, at a high level, board recommendations and regulation are analogous in several ways. Both are asking for changes in platform practices, and both have functions to measure whether those changes are actually working. So in, in the context of regulation, such as the EU's Digital Services Act, regulators, auditors, and platforms will need to have the right indicator to measure if, number one, the mitigations that they're asking for are implemented by the platforms, and number two, effective at addressing what it is they've asked for. So with the EU's Digital Services Act, an unprecedented amount of data will be requested by regulators and disclosed by platforms. And because the board has been making a similar request to Meta for four years now, we think that some of the challenges that we've gone through and success we've had can be important lessons for regulators as they take this on. So if you don't believe me, that's okay. Um, I'm here to prove you wrong. Um, I'm gonna provide a direct example of the board's regulation and or the board's recommendations and regulations overlap. So in July, excuse me, in 2021, the board issued a recommendation in the breast cancer symptoms case asking Meta to notify users of the reasons that they violated the policy, including the specific reason they violated it. So if a user had violated the nudity policy, the board is requesting that Meta tell the user under the nudity policy which rule they violated. However, we learned from Meta's response that yes, they're going to implement the recommendation, but their systems aren't designed to provide this level of granular detail that the board had requested. And they actually went on to say too that um, their user messaging would be inaccurate if it tried to provide the granular level of detail that the board wanted. A year later, the Digital Services Act went into effect, or was passed, and under the Digital Services Act, um, uh, platforms will need to provide uh, specific statements of reason for the enforcement decisions on a piece of content on their platform. So Meta will need to um, build more specific statements to, er, provide more specific statements to users and will likely need to spin up more detailed tracking um, in order to do this. And so therefore, while the board's recommendations aren't binding, they can serve as a bellwether to help platforms understand what regulators are asking them to do and help regulators understand what it is they should be asking platforms to do and how to best ask for it. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be diving into these best practices that we've developed. So from our experience, we've learned that a strong recommendation starts first with how the requests to platforms are crafted. So to make a strong recommendation, we learned that it should have an expected measure of implementation. So this is why our recommendations, which you can see an example of which on the screen, include that final sentence, the board will consider this recommendation implemented when. When we didn't include the sentence, Meta would misinterpret the goal of the recommendation or would propose a different solution that wouldn't address what we wanted achieved. This extra sentence signals to Meta, hey, this is where we're going to be measuring the change and success of our recommendations. Second, we found that the best, um, it was best to ask for only one change per recommendation. Um, so if, for example, we had issued a recommendation with four requests and Meta only implemented three of them, we wouldn't have an accurate way of knowing how big of an issue it was that Meta didn't address that one aspect of the recommendation. So to provide um, for full clarity um, and increase our assessment understanding of compliance, it was better to divide these asks up. Last, we found that having opportunities to clarify the intent in writing or in conversations with Meta has been beneficial on not only the recommendations at hand, but also for future recommendations. So the breast cancer case shared earlier with telling users which rule they violated is a great example of this. 
if Meta hadn't told us that they couldn't apply or they couldn't implement the recommendation because of a systems change, um, we wouldn't know that uh, that is the reason stopping the implementation and maybe in the future we can make a recommendation addressing that issue. So continuing with this last point on written communication with Meta, we also found that having a point system to assess Meta's responses can help indicate if Meta and the board are aligned on what is being asked of Meta or if we're talking past each other. So on the side, you'll see the different factors here that we're looking for in Meta's responses. Um, so if Meta's response includes all three factors, meaning it acknowledged and addressed all components of the recommendation, it provided a concrete timeline of when it expects the recommendation to be implemented by, and it committed to a concrete action for what it will do to take, uh, to implement the recommendation, then the response receives a comprehensive score. Um, if the response only includes one factor or none, uh, the response is not comprehensive. So these factors are an incentive to generate impact, um, to, to, to incentive for Meta and to generate impact with our non-binding recommendations. If they don't, if Meta doesn't, if Meta says they're going to implement the recommendation and they don't include these factors in the response, it's hard for us to independently verify that they're going to do it. So while our recommendations are non-binding, I actually think this is a really great carrot for getting Meta to actually implement the recommendations. Um, if the board makes a really good recommendation that's hard justifying not implementing, then Meta will need to do so publicly and that will hold, have to hold up in the court of public opinion. Um, if Meta chooses to implement something, that's great, but these factors will hold them accountable in implementing the recommendations in the way that we've intended. So the impact of these best practices can be seen in the numbers of recommendations that we have proof Meta implemented, which is 41%, over those that Meta declined, which is 30%. Um, as we've done this, we found that it's particularly important to iterate with Meta on the key metrics and data used to validate implementation. So over the next few slides, going into the second half of the talk, I'm going to be running through a series of case studies where it was harder than expected to understand Meta's implementation. Um, a key learning here and through line is that defining the right metrics for success requires dialogue and collaboration with the platform and we're still trying to improve on this process. Awesome, so the first case study is again with breast cancer. So a user in Brazil, had posted a picture raising awareness of breast cancer that was wrongfully removed under the nudity policy. Um, the board recommended that Meta improve its automated detection of this type of content so that helpful, uh, helpful content raising awareness of breast cancer isn't wrongfully removed under the nudity policy. So in response to the recommendation, Meta rolled out a new classifier that would assist in recognizing medical photos um, and wouldn't flag them um, to be removed under the nudity policy. Instead, they would be routed to a human reviewer for that review. To prove implementation, the board requested that Meta share information on how many fewer pieces of content were identified as violating because of this classifier improvement. However, first to understand the um, improvements, we needed to know the rate of takedowns Meta was making before um, creating the new classifier. Um, so we needed to know a little bit more context. So even though Meta shared um, the full number of pieces of content that would have been removed and are now not, which is 2,500 pieces of content, um, we don't have a sense of how this number fits into the wider pool of all content. We don't know if there are 2,500 pieces of content a month of breast cancer um, or if that number is larger. And so the lesson here is requesting a denominator to understand the scope of impact. Um, we know, have no way of knowing if our metric um, is signaling a large change in meta or not. In the second case study, um, we improve on the first in that we were able to demonstrate a change in our, from our request. Um, however, we were only able to do this with our own analysis. So the case study is on protests that occurred in Iran in 2022. Um, Meta had removed a Facebook post 
uh, a user posting um, a protest, protesting the Iranian government, uh, which contained a slogan in Farsi that translates to death to the supreme leader of Iran. So the board disagreed with Meta's decision and believed that it should stay on the platform and issued a recommendation that Meta should allow users to post a slogan on Meta's platforms in the context of Iranian protests. Um, in response, Meta said, yeah, we implemented it. However, they didn't share any data to verify this implementation. The board has access to CrowdTangle, which is a social media insights tool owned by Meta. Um, and we were able to evaluate a statistically significant difference between the number of posts mentioning the phrase before our uh, recommendation was issued or implemented by Meta compared to afterwards. So the key learning here is that having live data pipelines um, are critical for researchers, which I know at Stanford with researchers, I don't need to emphasize this point enough, but being sometimes um, platforms won't work with you to have that metric of success. Um, and by having these independent data pipelines, we were able to demonstrate that 30%, uh, there was a 30% increase of posts mentioning this phrase on Instagram after the board's decision. Cool. All right, in the last case study, um, we focus on asking for granular data and the barriers that we run into trying to receive it. So the case study concerns um, indigenous art and hate speech. The user had posted a picture referencing unmarked graves of indigenous children in British Columbia. Um, in the case, uh, the, or, and this content was taken down by Meta under hate, a hate speech policy. In the case, the board decided that the content was a clear example of empowerment and ra aware, awareness raising. Um, and in the decision, the board requested that Meta conduct an accuracy assessment focused on hate speech policy allowances that cover artistic expression in indigenous communities. So in other words, we're asking Meta, hey, how good are you, do you think you are at um, labeling allowances under the hate speech policy for indigenous communities? So right off the bat, there are some system designs with this recommendation, there's some flaws with this recommendation. Um, it's actually a really heavy data request to make to Meta. Um, the board is asking for data on not only instances when Meta is uh, providing an exception to their policy, but also a subsection, which is artistic allowances within uh, the overall allowances that it makes to hate speech. And on top of that, we're asking for how it impacts a small, uh, a relatively small community. Um, one thing that Meta didn't mention, uh, or excuse me, uh, which I will talk about the response, but um, another issue uh, here is that um, in order to um, ethnic or racial identities of users to be able to understand how it's impacting this uh, particular community. Um, so in response, Meta noted several challenges with implementing this recommendation. Um, first, Meta doesn't track the specific allowances of artistic expression within the overall allowances that it makes for hate speech. Um, second, it doesn't have this data readily available. So to be able to test um, our recommendation, they would need to have an identifiable sample and this wasn't easy for them to create. Um, so it would be a really resource intensive list for Meta to do. And last, the um, there would need to be a um, sample large enough to pull meaningful, uh, statistically meaningful results from. Um, so while the board is asking for something meaningful, um, the type of requests we're making make it uh, a little bit untenable for Meta to implement. So with all of those limitations to prove implementation, Meta provided the board with an overall accuracy metric of how well um, they're doing with hate speech. So while this gives us a general sense of how well they're doing labeling hate speech, it doesn't tell us information to prove our specific recommendation. And so the lesson we learned here is how to request granular data while understanding Meta's limitations. This uh, it wasn't in the paper, but uh, because it happened more recently, but we were able to take the lessons from the Wampum Belt case and apply them in a recent case on Holocaust denial content. Um, and in the case, we asked Meta to measure the accuracy of its enforcement of this type of content. So 
in the recommendation, um, we actually also reference a system design change that Meta made because of a prior recommendation that would make this tracking more easy to do. Um, we also improved by not referencing a specific small community, um, and so make it a little bit of a higher level uh, of data collection. And in response, Meta said that they would implement the recommendation, and they shared ways in which they would um, do that by uh, selecting a representative sample, addressing the markets that they would um, analyze, and also confirmed that they would share this data with the board. So already we have a much more closer metric to what we're asking for than the overall hate speech precision metric. So in conclusion, there are three key lessons I wanna leave you with today. The first is around communication. Both regulators and platforms can benefit from setting clear expectations and criteria on what we're going to evaluate them on. Um, so this is our sentence, the board will consider this recommendation implemented when. Um, we know that the request to, to platforms in regulation sometimes can get lost in translation or be extremely vague. And having opportunities to clarify this um, is critical to close that gap. Second, we found that evaluating the comprehensiveness of a platform's response and the extent of implementation incentivizes information sharing. So this is our uh, point system on the responses that I went over. Um, this not only pays uh, not only is beneficial for the compliance at hand, but also pays dividends for future requests from regulators. And finally, we uh, from the case studies, uh, we demonstrated that the right metric to determine impact is challenging, uh, but dialogue between regulators and platforms and also learning from those who have done this before can be really helpful in supporting um, the ultimate goal of the regulation um, and hope close that gap between what we wanted changed and what was actually changed. So as a conversation turns towards auditing norms, so how well are regulators complying, or excuse me, how well are platforms complying with regulators' requests, um, this dialogue will be key in setting gold standards for measurement and understanding impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carly. Uh, super clear uh, presentation and really um, highlights the, the challenges that uh, regulators are going to face as they start working on this. I love the connection actually between uh, the board uh, and regulators. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start off with a question. Is it possible actually to put Carly's slides back up? Is that, um, and I'm thinking of the one that had the percentages in terms of your analysis. I just wanted to quickly go back uh, to that one. I think towards the middle. A little bit uh, further ahead and yeah. there, yeah. <clears throat> so if I was a regular, let's say that I'm, I'm in Europe somewhere and I'm trying to understand, say, compliance with the DSA on maybe one of these new well-being metrics that they're doing. Do you, could you help us think through what these numbers sort of mean? Like, would we be happy with these? Is there thresholds that you think? Because, you know, clearly 100% probably not feasible, but zero is not okay. So what do we think of like these in terms of understanding them? Totally. Um, you guys, is Sound this good, working? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I So prefacing this a little bit, um, these numbers are on the recommendations that we've made over our entire process. So over 260 of them um, and some, and so the numbers are representing those that we have, um, those are all of them um, that you can see. And so some of them that are closed out by Meta um, and closed out by us are legacy from when we didn't have a lot of some of this, uh, from the practices that we've developed on setting those clear expectations. Some of our, rec our recommendations weren't numbered. So I will take some of that, um, just scene setting a little bit, setting those numbers in context. Um, I think that the numbers are helpful in showing that there is change. Um, it's amazing to have a behemoth like Meta make changes. Um, 
And so I think we should be really proud with some of those numbers and implementation demonstrated especially, um, which you can see, yeah, is 41%. Um, but I also would encourage people to read the responses that Meta had made to why they rejected a recommendation. And so um, even though maybe someone would mark that as not um, super successful, mm -hmm. I actually think that it's getting any information from Meta for why they wouldn't do something is really beneficial. Gotcha. And so you're saying that if we looked at this over time, we might see you know, these uh, the fully implemented ones rising with, with time? Yeah. <coughs> um, and also the number that Meta had rejected mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a really big number of like progress reported recommendations. And so those, like this takes time mm -hmm. to implement. Um, and so, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, great. Um, one of the other things I've been thinking about is, is the, the, whoops, the future here is really uncertain. You've got uh, movement into this sort of post-Musk era mm -hmm. of uh, social media taking trust and safety approaches. Uh, you've got uh, crowd tangle services coming to an end. Yeah. Um, and you have uh, European regulators putting into place some restrictions that are coming in here. To what degree does, is your sense that the <coughs> oversight board is either reacting to those mm. kind of like scenarios or is starting to f lean into it and being like, we're going to be the example to show how it should be moving forward. So I realize those are three big things, but they're kind of things that you're all operating inside of that's sort of new yeah. within the last year or so. Yeah. Um, so for full disclosure, I don't sit on the board um, yet. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think, I think Jeff, you touch on a lot of interesting dynamics that are happening. I would even say like, you know, the rise in AI mm -hmm. is changing the content that we're seeing. Um, the board just announced taking um, a case on AI generated nudes. So I see us adapting to the type of content. It's really interesting because we pull cases from the pool of what users are experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, it mirrors a lot of what's occurring. Um, I think that what I, what I hope for the, the dynamic that you're discussing with um, the environment changing, such as crowd tangle being, um, not being eff uh, in effect, um, regulation, um, I hope our paper can help demonstrate why the, why having independent access is important. Mm -hmm. um, un under the EU Digital Services Act, um, there is space for, um, it, there is uh, a need, platforms are required to provide right. um, data pipelines to researchers. Um, and so that, I think this paper helps underscore that. Um, but as I presented with the um, parallel between um, the requests that we made to Meta on user notification and the D DSA mm -hmm. um, regulation. I think that what needs to change, people have an understanding maybe mm -hmm. of that, but it's not, what we try to demonstrate is that it's not a flip of the switch. Like it really takes time to get to that right metric. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's open it up to the um, floor, see if there's any questions here uh, for Carly. Okay, Shelby. Hi, uh, so just yesterday I was using a bunch of oversight board cases in my class because they're like such useful teaching tools. Um, and you know, one of the things the cl in the class we were talking about is often the recommendations are around increasing transparency, encouraging Meta to increase transparency about what their policies are. And sometimes it seems like there are like reasonable reasons why Meta might not want to be super transparent about their policies. And I was just wondering like how you all think about that when you're making policy transparency recommendations. Yeah, that's a great question. And also, hi, Shelby. Um, there is a tension between um, having transparency around Meta's practices and the fear that those would be um, used by bad actors um, to game, so to speak. Um, I think that with the recommendations, we're trying to address the systemic issue of the case, why the case ended up in front of the board. Um, and like through the research of putting together the case, um, 
if things aren't clear, um, I think that's a helpful indicator where you know, uh, we're receiving information from Meta um, in our like, Q&A process on how things are working, and some of that isn't totally public. Um, and so I think thinking, putting ourselves in the shoes of users is how I think that the, I, if, I think the panel thinks about that. Um, it's interesting, we just had a case about Sudanese conflict, um, and we published a recommendation that was like link to, uh, that Meta should link to the lists that the US uses for like designating individuals. And it's like such a, it's like add a, <laughs> like, uh, add a URL link like that. But we're just trying to provide more information. And I think that pays dividends in like how Meta is thinking about this and how they're thinking about um, designated individuals. So it's more about that process question, but I think that there is that tension and like Meta will push back when they don't want to disclose information. Great, thanks Shelby. Thank you. Um, I have a short question and a long question. <laughs> they go together. Um, so the examples that you gave of you asking um, Facebook for data mm -hmm. and them, they, they gave you things that clearly could not possibly be responsive to your question in each and every one of those instances. Like when you're asking for change over time and they just give you an absolute one-time number and by the way, it's a number of something other than what you asked for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's not even false positive. <coughs> is, so the, the question there is, do they have some reason for all of those? Like, are they always coming back and saying, um, actually, we can't measure that because X, uh, you know, as they were in the case of tracking the ethnic identity of the users involved or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the, <laughs> I said it was short. <laughs> that's the short question. Um, and then the, the, I think, related question is, where are you taking these learnings? Like, are you just taking these learnings, just, it's, it's still incredibly useful, but are you, are you just taking these learnings and teaching them to, like, the European Commission? Or are you also going to intervening bodies like the auditors, who will probably be the first ones to have to, like, relearn these same lessons under the, the DSA? Like, who, who's, who all gets to learn from you? That's a great question, Daphne, both questions. Um, I may pass it the first off to my colleague um, to answer that, if that's all right. Okay, um, maybe I'll take the, sec the second one, though. Um, I think it's great that um, the Oversight Board supported our team in publishing um, our learnings in the Journal of Online Trust and Safety to be able to capture this. Um, we're gonna be presenting at uh, TrustCon, um, and so taking those lessons I hope people <laughs> learn from that. I don't know. I, I mean, um, I think the, the the auditor question is 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 um, like this is exactly what they should be um, looking for. But Naomi, if you want to um, provide context, yeah, J just to say why I think they're connected. Like yeah. I think a lot of your learning is about the need for a back and forth to arrive totally. at like what are we asking for and what is totally. a useful response. And if the auditors don't know totally. <laughs> that that process needs to happen, then yeah. it's really going to uh, hinder them. Totally. Yeah, and Naomi, do you want to just introduce yourself? Sorry, um, I'm Naomi. I run the data and implementation team for the Oversight Board. Um, and Carly, great presentation. Thank Congrats. Um, that was really fun to watch. Um, so uh, to the auditor question, so we, we have spoken, um, you know, sort of like casually with some auditors. I think a lot of people are really just, a lot of these organizations are just getting started and trying to figure out the lack of standards is obviously like the huge problem. Um, so one of the reasons that we publish this is with the hope that uh, they will read our paper and they will come and talk to us and if anybody is listening, we are happy to talk to you. Um, to the first question on the data, so for that, that 2,500 pieces of content, we actually did have a time period for that. It was, it was 30 days. It's still not that helpful because we don't know how many pieces of breast cancer content overall were taken down as opposed to just push to, to automated review. But it's not quite as disconnected. We're simplifying it a lot, obviously, for the presentation and encourage you to read the paper to, to see the full depth. Um, you know, over time, we, we are seeing that the context is increasing. So there's another, the last case study in the paper that we didn't present on um, is on uh, basically a friction notification that Meta sent to users saying, are you sure you wanna post this? It's probably gonna be violating. Um, and we got the exact number, so it was over a three month period. It was sent for like 100 million pieces of content. 20% of users chose to take a different action. So this, 
over time, we have, Meta has gotten better at providing more and more and more context, and it's getting closer and closer to what we're asking for. Um, and I think it is because of this public back and forth that we've had that has kind of pushed in, in that direction. Um, but your, your point is well taken, and I think part of the reason we wanted to show this progression over time is that at the beginning, we, were, we had the same kind of like, what is this um, reaction? And thankfully, it's getting better. Yeah, and I just want to um, add in the Digital Services Act, um, or in the um, European Commission, there is this um, dashboard. Daphne, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and it shows like the actions of different platforms and you see like 14 billion actions taken on the Google store. And like with the breast cancer, I mean different volume there, but like we have no idea what that means. Like, okay, the Google store is doing a ton of volume of stuff, but like are, th are those violative? Like what types of things? And so I think that there is a direct parallel to getting um, more helpful context for how to, how to view that, those numbers instead of just like 14 billion pieces of content. Great, thanks Carly. And, um, uh, we have a, a, an online question. Actually, it's a two-parter. Cool. From Chris. Um, so do you see parallels in transparency requirements for data APIs with respect to social networks and AI models? I, I'm not sure I am like best positioned to answer that. Um, yeah, um, but I'm not even sure like regulation is there yet. Right. So right, right, right. <laughs> actually it isn't there yet. Um, and so I think that you could take a lot of the transparency lessons that we're learning um, around something where we're trying to define, you know, what is success look like. I think that is something like a step removed, you can definitely apply to different things, but I look forward to reading that paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> we'll try and get it into jots right away. Um, what do you, and it, it, this is the second part of his question, what's the hope that there's similar transparency requirements that you're developing with the oversight board? Um, will they apply and spread, do you think, to s other social networks to make a market for oversight? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is um, the reason why we wrote this paper is because of the applicability to industry. Um, and especially in that last point about auditing norms and to Daphne's point around um, auditors trying to figure out what type of transparency and disclosure that that looks like. Um, you know, Daphne has a lot of great work on um, kind of the vagueness of the Digital Services Act around transparency. Um, you know, Article 17 saying to tell users, which will, you know, add a specific statement of reason for enforcement. Like, what does that statement look like? And how specific? Um, there aren't a lot of guidance around that. And so our paper demonstrates how we went about um, pulling meaningful information from the compliance that we're being asked of for Meta. Um, and I think that there, there, I mean, there's regulation, so there is a floor that platforms will need to do to do that. Um, and hopefully, yeah, hopefully um, auditors and regulators will see the meaning behind um, what it is that we're, we're doing. Great, right, okay, cool. Other questions uh, from the room? Thank you very much uh, for sharing the insights from Oversight Board. Uh, I'm wondering, many of the case, uh, case studies you have shown is kind of like showing the false alarm that users have identified. And do, uh, have you observed anything that uh, maybe Meta ha has missed? Uh, example is kind of false information. Uh, and in those kind of cases, based on experience, have you made kind of what kind of recommendations to Meta and what kind of responses or dynamic and decisions that for Meta? that you have observed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one of the really exciting things about the Oversight Board is that you know, Meta is making so much content decisions, or decisions on so much content every second, and users can flag to us, like, I don't, I don't agree with what was done um, to my content. And the interesting case, the, the cases that we've chosen, and you're right, that we've displayed are, instances where Meta um, 
was wrong in um, there were there were false positives. Um, I think that it also it speaks to just how difficult this is to do at scale. Um, the amount of you know hate speech that Meta probably receives daily is crazy, and trying to find like the needle in the haystack of artistic expression for indigenous people under hate speech is, is really specific, but like important. Um, and so, yeah, I think that these cases are great to take time to like uncover that underneath all of that volume. Um, the interesting thing that you're pointing on too is that our recommendations address that huge system. Um, and so, I think it's a I think it's a process, and I think that's also why the recommendation we had that was um, to know how good Meta is at this very specific thing wasn't a really workable recommendation, but something that is a little bit higher level um, around um, you know Holocaust denial content, um, something that they're working on tagging and identifying can be helpful in like slowing down the process. So like, okay, how good are we at this? Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Great, other questions in the room? Um, all right, while we take this pause moment, I wanted to ask you something a little bit more personal, just given uh, that you were at the SIO. Um, you've transitioned, and you're, you're out there doing this like really difficult uh, kind of cutting edge work. Are there any messages you would have for students that are in the audience online or in the future about like how to think about what they should be doing as they prepare for a world that you know you've now entered and thinking about. Yes, the first actionable step is to take Alex Damos and Shelby Grossman's class. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know the name of the class, but trust and safety CS one fifty two. I think I have to do a trust and safety. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> trust and safety. Um, yeah, I am. Um, early in my career, um, I also think that the um, field has been around for a long time, but trust and safety is pretty new. Um, and so one thing, I, I came to this field through political science um, and trying to understand bad actors on, or understand um, like state propaganda on social media. Um, my advice to students, which is, is exciting to give, uh, is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, I was not too long ago, I was one of you, um, is to pursue something that you're interested in, um, in ways that you didn't expect um, to see. So for me, it was applying political science to um, technology. Um, one thing I will say as well, I, I think specifically for trust and safety, there's a big, there's a humbleness um, to this field that I've seen, and my mentor is watching um, them do it, that the trade-offs are impossible, and you're just trying to do good. Um, so I, I, I think that there is, um, yeah, a lot of good that comes from trust and safety, even though people might have opinions about you know, social media in general. Um, but yes, take the class. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, plus one that, it's great. Um, fantastic, yes, another um, question. I have a question. Uh, so this morning I was at the HAI conference and what the keynote speaker said, uh, political scientists no longer have to learn engineering and computer science, engineers have to learn political science, so that speaks to what your studies uh, and how they're relevant. But I have a question about your day-to-day. -day. So you're speaking about lessons learned for regulators, but how quickly do you have to learn the lessons? The oversight board and the staff and your implementation team, what is your timeline to learn and then teach these lessons that are kind of becoming like foundation, you're, you're setting a precedent here. It's a great question, Tracy. Um, it's interesting because also I'm one person on the team, um, so I might be working on one case and my colleague might be working on two other cases and we're both issuing recommendations and we wanna um, present a cohesive, you know, united, like the lessons have been implemented, but there's a lot of information sharing that needs to go on um, within our organization. Um, so 
a case timeline is 90 days, um, and so cases are at different stages of that. Um, what has been really helpful is um, the, respo the responses from Meta that we get. Um, so once a case is published, they have 60 days to respond. And if we have cases that are dealing with similar problems, um, we will flag those responses um, for why or why not Meta is doing something. Um, we also have had cases uh, where we'll reiterate recommendations, um, so we're not piling in, piling on the amount of recommendations we're making to Meta, but emphasizing those that we've already made. Um, but I think I think it's a learning process of trying to go back to the panel that decided on that case um, and understand that the you know the reasons why you fought for something were like not for nothing. <laughs> we have data. Um, and, and proving that and then helping our case to make similar recommendations in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question online and uh, relates to Meta's claims that it lacks information or doesn't track with enough granularity. Um, and given the examples like the indigenous case or the breast cancer case, uh, doesn't that necessarily mean that smaller, less powerful co communities are disadvantaged in the process? Is there a mitigation strategy? Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, and something that's important to highlight. Um, and I'm uh, glad that we have um, cases that look at um, these communities that maybe in the volume of content is missed mm -hmm. um, and how it's impacting. So. Um, Jeff, can you read the last part? Yeah, so question? just like, is, are there other communities that, um, you know, that, that are smaller, but is there a way that the oversight board or, or mm -hmm. that could think about trying to help out smaller communities that are a little, little bit less powerful? I mean, I think the indigenous one is a good example yeah. of a smaller community. Yeah, and I think that um, there are trade-offs involved in that because interest and safety, like there are alarms going off at all times. Like how do you weight this person's um, rights against like the onslaught of going against another person. There is only so many finite um, resources, and this is something that I think we've actually um, worked on and talked a lot with um, within the implementation committee um, on how to prioritize our requests to Meta. Um, of course, we want them to be good and. Um, be impactful for everybody on the platform, um, but there are ultimately trade-offs in, um, you know, what gets seen first. And I think having this might be an unsatisfying answer, but I think it's real in that um, we there there are only that 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 platform, such as Meta, and as wealthy and as resource um, rich as Meta have to also have trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the recommendations and the cases that we take are helpful in highlighting where the overall system is is failing people um, and, and we can make recommendations to address those um, and ultimately Meta will need to prioritize what it takes on and what it doesn't. Great. All right, any other last questions from the room? Fantastic. Well, I want to thank uh, Carly especially, but also Naomi for coming and sharing this. And the paper is available on the Journal of Online Trust and Safety for those of you who would like a little bit more information. And uh, we'll just have to say as a, as a Stanford professor, very, very proud of everything that you've been doing. So thank you once again. Let's all uh, appreciate Carly for what she's done. Thank you.